When I was young, I looked at the pigeons perched upon traffic lights and thought they were rescuers. I reasoned that when an animal was injured in the intersection, that they would swoop down and save them. Of course, I grew up and realized that pigeons aren't like us. They don't have professions. Humans are the only animal species that has the capacity to choose our jobs. Most animals, like bees or bonobos, are born into their specific role. They have to constantly strive to, su to sustain the hive or the tribe or some other collective. Every other organism lacks industries, labor specialization, and markets. Elephants have empathy. Starlings have language. Many animals have large prefrontal cortexes and the capacity to reason. But we are the only creatures who can choose what pursuits to devote our lives to. A 20th century philosopher, Hannah Arendt, shared this view, calling humans homo faber, or man as maker or producer. She delineated three categories of endeavors that we commonly undergo, labor, work, and action. Labor merely means anything necessary to sustain oneself. Eating, breathing, going to the grocery store to buy goods, etc. We share this category with other animals. It isn't the unique property I was alluding to earlier. It's a component of all life. Second is work, a technical term for a mandated profession or task, typically when, the, when one receives monetary compensation for it. Being a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a lumberjack, etc. are all forms of work. This is unique. As we've seen, other animals don't have work in this sense, but it isn't really humanizing. For most people, work is merely a means to an end, either as a gold paved path to a life of luxury and or a form of labor necessary for surviving at all. It's a hallmark component of society. So what is the meaningful part of Homo Faber's life? Arendt says action, the unique activities undertaken from urges of passion and creation. Action is free. This doesn't mean freedom in the sense that it's usually thought of. It doesn't involve the metaphysical question of whether we really make choices. Rather, action is free because of its unpredictability. To go back to pigeons, they are constrained by labor and their lack of creativity. Each time a pigeon is born, they just spend their lives going about stealing potato chips and waltzing around doing pigeon things. This goes on for generations and generations without change. There is no pigeon da Vinci or pigeon musk, whereas each human life promises something new. Art pieces, inventions, stories, dances, songs, and ideas. These instances of action also have the capacity to spread throughout society, to, inspi to both inspire further action, and to improve the original action through social feedback. Action is the path to self-actualization. This trio, the Vita Activa, is responsible for the creation of the current world revolutions, explorations, and other such cataclysmic events that molded modernity come about through action. Luxuries such as tasty food and soft clothes are provided via work, while labor sustains life through the recently dubbed essential jobs. Now, Hannah Arendt actually believed that all work and action has been degraded to labor in the modern era. She was a post-war philosopher, after all, and formed this observation from looking at the vapid, materialistic society of the 50s. I like to be more optimis optimistic, as there appears to be a distinction between the creative action that manifests out of one's own volition and the work slash labor done just to pay the rent. Although I will try not to fall into the trap of blind idealism through the duration of this talk, self-help often ignores economic realities. 
I'm not here to offer you a one-stop shop quick fix for every single problem that has ever befallen you and show you how to make every dream come true. Instead, I hope to offer some strategies to make work more meaningful. Some individuals will have the privilege to combine work and action, to be able to affirm both their passion and their income stream simultaneously. Most probably will not be able to choose their profession, perhaps because of economic limitations, parental approval, or other side constraints. That can be depressing, as work takes up a large portion of most lives. According to the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average employed person works about 39 hours per week. With holidays, there are about 48 working weeks, and the average age of retirement is around 63. That means, if one starts working at 20, they'll work for about 80,000 hours. To put that number into perspective, that is 9.2 years, waiting in 208,695 TSA lines at a busy U.S. airport, and the equivalent time of a journey and a half to Pluto. The bottom line is, we will spend most of our lives working for a profit. And if we can't make most of our lives meaningful, the nihilism will slowly begin to seep in. So what can you do? I'm going to offer you two paths, alluded to above. For those of you who are privileged enough to have endless career opportunities, of course strive for your passion, or find your kid guy, or engage in action through your profession. You can systematically explore careers with internships, education, and the vast knowledge of the internet. For this method, the most key aspect will be choice. In a 2018 article, Psychological researchers Frank Martella and Ann Pessy argued that a profession is perceived as meaningful due to how much freedom of self-realization it allows, and if it aligns with the worker's greater vision of benefiting society. The self-realization they mention is essentially equivalent to the degree that a job cultivates the autonomous side of action that Arendt mentioned 60 years earlier. On the other hand, the altruistic component of meaningful work seems to align with the social or plural component of action. In an ideal world, where we were not bound by economic or societal needs, a career would check both boxes, being both emblematic of the self and contributing to the whole. However, as mentioned above, that world is mere fantasy. And searching for a life passion, or a kigai, or action, we will most likely fail, stumble, and go down roads that lead to dead ends. Even those who land their dream jobs often have to trudge through boring grunt work or sometimes have a bad day. Although Disney lied to me, and it isn't feasible for each of us to have a happily ever after, we certainly can make reality more palatable. How? To change our work, we need to change our minds. Scholars Catherine Bailey and Adrian Madden conducted a study about what makes meaningful moments in work regardless of profession. They identified five common ingredients after interviewing 135 people. Self-transcendence, poignancy, episodicness, reflexivity, and relevance to personal life. Self-transcendence is essentially a rehash of the point about altruism earlier. But unfortunately, it can't be injected into every job. Poignancy is an interesting factor, because it reminds us that work doesn't always have to be happy to be meaningful. Moments can be bittersweet or even painful while still being considered meaningful. Episodicness refers to the property of meaningful moments, often making them short and intense. Reflecting on the moment often makes the subject realize the amount of value that was contained in the experience, pointing to the power of mere evaluation. This tactic, reflexivity, is the most universal. Everyone can reminisce about experiences and peruse them for meaning. Personal meaning merely refers to moments of making people we care about proud. Showing our loved ones the fruits of our labor can be incredibly rewarding, obviously. 
I would like to add a sixth property that I think has worked for me. Connections. Up until about seventh grade, I despised school. I would have rather been playing soccer or reading in the library or doing anything else as a 12-year-old. It seemed boring, monotonous, and pointless. I wondered what ancient history had to do with my present moments, and why I had to learn about those little pesky things called atoms. I was beginning to get passionate about one subject field, though. Philosophy. Although my school offered no instruction in it, I watched lectures, read books, gobbled up any info I could find on the important problems of essence, morality, and will. Connections between the deeper questions and what I was doing in day-to-day -day life began to show themselves. I saw that the ideas from ancient history molded my present moments, and the fact that everything is reducible to atoms causes metaphysical paradoxes. Everything suddenly lit up, as long as I could make it connect to the field I love so much. This trend continues up till today. Trying to find the logical principles that make math function and analyzing the moral frameworks of literary characters lets me trick my brain into enjoying education even when it promises hours of work. I'm hoping this tactic will continue to work in college and beyond to my professional life. This technique isn't locked to my specific interest, however. Anyone can apply it. Artists can take note of how aesthetics manifest themselves in real life. They could observe anything from how individuals employ their fashion styles to how ads are made attractive in the interest of profit to the little moments of beauty to recreate later, such as rain shining on the roads or a particular pretty bird. Those interested in engineering can observe how physical laws play out in the real world. What is a better lab than reality? One can observe what problems need to be solved, bridges to be fixed, devices to be made. Writers can reflect on their physical surroundings and or overheard dialogue in any profession. Noticing details can allow one to deploy them in future stories, and real-life happenings can manifest in fiction. The principle holds. One can cultivate a symbiotic relationship bet between one's environment and one's underlying passion. The connection won't just rise up from the void, though. This relationship is a product of the reflection point four above. Sometimes the link will be less obvious. Sometimes it will have to be imagined. But if it doesn't initially exist, it can always be manufactured. Once the bridges are built, the path to action, self-realization, or whatever else one wants to call it becomes clear. Work no longer is a brick in the wall but a task that can serve as inspiration. This construction fosters ingenuity, because each person's everyday work is unique to them. So using it results in newness as well. For example, a poet who works in an HR department may be able to utilize that which they've observed about human nature to create a moralistic piece, whereas someone such as a park ranger may be more inclined to write a more pastoral poem. So, in this era, where work is looked at as dehumanizing, let us reconceptualize work as the thing that makes us human. Let us strive to morph flavor into action in order to imbue our lives with meaning. Because some say that modernity has sucked the life out of work, which may be true to a certain degree, but no one can stop you from reviving meaning. I implore you all to embrace the Vita Activa, the act of life, with a healthy combination of self-expression, pro-social goals, and an active searching for unexpected connections. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk.